Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to this panel discussion on the future of equity in Vermont education. My name is Kendra Sowers, and I'm on the Burlington School Board, and I'm also the chair of the, of the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity, who's hosting this event tonight. The coalition is composed of school board members from various communities and districts from all across the state. We share a common belief that all of Vermont's children deserve equitable education, educational outcomes. Our mission is to advocate that the legislature adopt the recommendations of the pupil weighting factors report during this current legislative biennium. Tonight's event features five panelists who will be talking about the current state of education funding, explaining how it works, describing the challenges school districts face, and discussing the current proposal being put forth by the legislative task force that could affect future education funding. We will leave time at the end for Q&A and you're also welcome to type questions in the chat as we go along or wait until the discussion has finished and, and raise your virtual hand to be called on. We will be sure to take as many questions as we can after the panel discussion. So I'm delighted now to introduce the panelists for tonight's discussion. Panelists, please wave your hand when I introduce you so everyone knows who you are. Nicole Mace is the finance manager at the Winooski School District. She has a law degree from the University of Pittsburgh and a master's degree in public policy and management from Carnegie Mellon University. Nicole was the general counsel and then executive director of the Vermont School Boards Association from 2011 to 2019. She is a parent of a fifth grader at JFK Elementary School in Winooski and has been a resident of Winooski since 2009. Nicole served on the Winooski City Council from 2015 to 2019. Welcome, Nicole. Ted Plamenis is the Chief Financial Officer for the Rutland City Public Schools. After earning a bachelor's degree in public and international affairs and a master's degree in business administration, Ted served as a financial executive for ExxonMobil Corporation for more than 30 years. His prior experience in education finance includes serving for two years as the Director of Finance and Administration for a division of Rice University and volunteering for several years as an advisor to the Board of Trustees for an elementary and a middle school. Welcome, Ted. Alex Yen has been serving on the Winooski School Board since 2017. While on the board, he helped pass a $57.8 million bond to build and renovate school facilities for an overcrowded district. He has also been an advocate in turning the cultural liaison positions in Winooski into a year-long position to help strengthen the relationship between the new American families and the school district. Alex is the executive director of institutional research at the University of Vermont, where he is responsible for the school's data analytics. Welcome to you, Alex. Rory Tebow is the current chair of the Cabot School Board of Directors and also serves on the Caledonia Central Supervisory Union Board. Rory's school board involvement began with Cabot's Act 46 process. He served as the primary author of the Cabot School District Alternative Governance Structure Proposal, which was ultimately accepted by the State Board of Education. During his time as a board member, Rory has focused on supporting, supporting Cabot School's innovative approaches to public education, namely the integration of project-based learning into all grade levels, and most recently, increased collaboration with other districts within the enlarged supervisory union. Rory is the state's attorney for Washington County. Welcome, Rory. Representative Laura Sevilla was elected in 2014 and currently serves in the Vermont House of Representatives. She is the vice chair of the Energy and Technology Committee. Laura has lived in Southern Vermont for more than 30 years and has served on the Dover School Board since 2003. She was a pioneering member of the New River Valley School District Board in 2018 and has been working on the pupil waiting issue for many years. Welcome, Laura, and thank you to all the panelists for being here this evening. So let's begin. I think it would be really helpful to start this discussion by providing some background for our discussion. So Nicole, I was hoping you could talk to us about the Brigham decision and how it led to Act 60, which is the basis of our existing funding formula. 
Sure, happy to. So Brigham versus State of Vermont was a 1997 decision of the Vermont Supreme Court. At the time of the decision, Vermont funded public education through a combination of local property tax assessments and state aid, which was known as the foundation plan. The plaintiffs in Brigham alleged that that funding system violated the Vermont Constitution by one, depriving students residing in property poor school districts of their right to the same educational opportunities as students in wealthier um, districts, and also depriving property poor school districts of the ability to raise sufficient money to provide educational opportunities equal to those in wealthier school districts and compelling those districts to impose disproportionately high tax rates. So upon uh, examining the evidence, the court determined that um, the evidence did support plaintiff's claim that wide disparities in student expenditures existed and that those disparities generally correlated with taxable property wealth within the districts. And I'm gonna give you a couple quotes from the decision. Quote, although equal dollar resources do not necessarily translate equally in effect, there is no reasonable doubt that substantial funding differences significantly affect opportunities to learn. Money is clearly not the only variable affecting educational opportunity, but it is one that government can effectively equalize. The court held then that the education funding system with its wide disparities in revenue available to school districts deprived children of an equal educational opportunity, which was a violation of Vermont's constitution. The court also held that um, their ruling did not require absolute equality of funding. Quote, equal opportunity does not necessarily require precisely equal per capita expenditures, but it does not allow a system in which equal, in which educational opportunity is necessarily a function of district wealth. To fulfill its constitutional obligation, the state must ensure substantial equality of educational opportunity throughout Vermont. So uh, very shortly after that decision, I believe that decision came down in December or January. And by the end of that legislative session, uh, the legislature passed Act 60. Great, thank you, Nicole. Mm -hmm. Ted, could you give us a dis overall description of what the pupil waiting study is for those who aren't familiar with it? And also, could you touch on how current education funding formula works along with helping all of us understand what the excess spending threshold is? Sure, well, good evening, everybody. And thank you for taking time to uh, join us in this discussion. Uh, those topics, Kendra, that you just mentioned, of course, um, could be subjects for a very lengthy discussion, but let me see what I can do to give you a, a thumbnail sketch of some of the key aspects of that. Um, by the way, just, just again as background, um, I, I have ha had some background um, over, over a number of years with education at many levels. I'm very passionate about education because I've seen what it can do for so many people. My main expertise, of course, is in the financial domain, but I'm in this role because I, I, I'm intent on using my financial skills to help uh, progress and advocate for high quality education for students uh, throughout the state of Vermont. And I'm, I feel very privileged and fortunate to be in that role. Um, but to answer your question, um, the waiting study, which was issued at the end of calendar year 2019, in, in December of 2019, was a study that was commissioned by the legislature uh, which recognized that there were some issues uh, with the approach that had been used to allocate educational funding throughout the state. And as many people know, and I'll summarize briefly, um, the same basic formula and set of weights uh, that had been set up more than 20 years ago, uh, and which presents some challenges and operations, but was operating adequately, one might say. Um, nevertheless, was using weights um, and factors that were never significantly revised over that 20 years plus. And, and of course, during that time frame, uh, as everybody knows, there have been major shifts in demographics, major shifts in the costs. Uh, different costs go up at different rates, and that uh, makes a big difference over the course of a couple of decades. 
So the legislature wisely uh, chose to request a, a team of outstanding and highly recognized academics, including Professor Colby from UVM and Professor Baker from Rutgers, uh, to go ahead and undertake an objective study to understand what changes might be needed um, in the weights that are used for that funding formula. And, and recognizing that uh, the Agency of Education has the primary charge for administering and managing, the, managing that formula based upon standard sets of data that have been used you know, over the course of the 20 years and unfortunately without any changes in those weights. So what I would say is, I think most people who have taken a look at the study, many people who have commented on the study would describe it as very thorough research, uh, a very robust uh, data analytical uh, report, and one that uses very sound statistical modeling. I have, um, I've had the opportunity to listen into some of the task force hearings, as well as some of the legislative testimony uh, that occurred earlier this year. And in the times when I've had the opportunity to listen to those commentaries, um, the comments I've heard about the study have all been highly complimentary, uh, both in terms of the methods used and, and how the results and the recommendations were developed. Of course, as is the case with any complex area, and in this case, a complex study, uh, using it and applying it properly and correctly does require a great deal of care, understanding, and in some, in some respects, understanding of statistical issues, policy issues, educational issues. So suffice it to say, when you read through the 150 pages of the report and its various statistical tables, that is not a light read uh, and it does require um, careful consideration. The, the flip side of that would be to say, if one does not exercise that type of care, it could be very easy to reach incorrect conclusions um, because of, again, how holistically things are, are, are developed and, and, and how the models and, and the recommendations were provided. One of the things that I think the, the team, the study team did that was excellent is instead of taking a shotgun or a scattered approach, they did the research to identify five to six key drivers of educational costs. And they worked on that uh, through their research and ultimately used those factors as the basis for their modeling. Um, and I think most people would agree that that was a very important approach um, uh, that provided the soundness and integrity that most people believe exists there. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the present formula itself, um, I've been in my position for about a year and a half. Um, as I mentioned, I have an extensive financial and quantitative background. I will tell you that the process that the, the AOE in the state of Vermont uses is, um, is complex and it does require careful attention to detail. Um, my colleagues at the AOE do what I consider to be an admirable job, admirable job of uh, making sure that you know, those statistics, and there's quite a variety of them that go into the formula, uh, are gathered timely and correctly. And uh, when, when revisions are necessary, uh, they work very hard to get that through with the objective, of course, of doing the best job possible in any given year to apply the metrics that will be used to allocate obviously hundreds of millions of dollars of educational funding across the state. So it works well, it's not easy, but at least it's consistent. And, and there is a great opportunity for improvement in the present formula by updating these weights and implementing the, uh, the recommendations of the weighting study, which is, is why it's a good thing for everyone in the state that the legislature decided earlier this year to create the task force that's been working so hard since the summer to develop an action plan in terms of how one might best implement that formula with all of the change management uh, issues that are naturally involved with such a complex area. Briefly, in terms of the excess spending threshold that you asked about, Kendra, I would say that um, like many aspects of the present funding formula, it was developed with good intentions and it had admirable goals, uh, or at least one could say that, you know, an excess spending threshold is, is a threshold that is set to say, well, 
if a district just decides to spend unnecessarily large amounts of money just because they can and they want to, the state's gonna say, well, wait a minute, um, in the interests of trying to keep the, the playing field somewhat level, if we think, and I'm gonna use just an example of simple numerics to make the point, if we think that the average cost per student should be in the range of $20,000 per year, and if a district were to decide to go way past that and spend twenty-five dollars or $30,000 per year, then the excess spending threshold is a way for the state to say, well, we wanna give you some disincentive for overspending unless you really think it's necessary. So we're gonna have a, a penalty uh, with some additional fees that are owed to the state if you blow through that excess spending threshold. So one can argue, well, that's, that's a, a way to try and accomplish some balance across the state. Unfortunately, uh, because of the mechanics of that threshold, it probably, in my opinion, and I think you could find others who would agree, it probably has not been updated the way it could have and should have been, much like the weights themselves. And the problem that that has created is in districts such as the Rutland City Public Schools, where, where I work, um, and where we have a high percentage of students from low-income families or coming with other issues, um, it requires a higher level of spending per student uh, to provide the services that they need. You'll oftentimes hear teachers and administrators speak in terms of the most effective education is for us to meet the student where the student is when he or she comes into the school system. And as you can appreciate, you know, many students come at different points, depending upon the nature of their experiences. Some are very familiar with computers and take the technology quickly. Others have perhaps not seen a computer and so need additional support. So those are simple examples of we can get into later where it doesn't And I'm gonna stop you right that. now because I know we have Thank a lot you. of questions and I think Sorry people are, are you, getting Katie. the gist of what that was. And okay. so I appreciate your, um, your explanation, but I just wanna be sure we get time for the other questions. Sure, Sorry about Thank that. You. Thank you. Oh, it's, it's very helpful. Um, so Laura, I was really hoping you've been very active on this issue and I'm wondering if you could talk with us about how you first came to this work, um, including passing the pupil waiting study in 2018 and then the eventual passage of S-13 that led to the creation of the Legislative Task Force. Sure, so uh, this is an issue like Ted uh, that I care really, uh, uh, that I care a lot about um, public education. Um, it's something that I have had a, um, you know, front, front row seat uh, to seeing the inequities in our district and in, um, and in the adjacent districts to us. Uh, <clears throat> the, sorry, my husband has just stepped in here. Um, so <laughs> my apologies. Uh, so I've been following this uh, long before I was in the legislature. And in fact, this propelled me into the legislature. It was an issue that um, it was very clear um, to see that Act 60 was not working as it had intended. Um, we knew that something was wrong. Uh, we, um, in our region in Southern Vermont, uh, work together to try and uh, conduct different economic analysis, to um, have lobbyists uh, help us try and raise this issue in the legislature. I myself went and testified a number of times um, about this issue, and we kind of just got um, you know, stiff-armed and, uh, and uh, really frustrated. Uh, and the situation was not kind of static, in our region, we could see um, in addition uh, with, with this system that was inequitable and making things worse, we were also seeing population decline and an increase in poverty, which are two things that really will exacerbate this type of situation. So when we came into the uh, legislature, when I came into the legislature, I worked with, there are a number of legislators actually who um, had a sense that this system was not operating equitably. We were trying to push um, uh, things like um, uh, chart of accounts, you know, helping us understand what we were spending money on, um, trying to get after what are the differences that we're seeing and, and how, uh, how is that translating in education for kids. Uh, so we <clears throat> eventually were able to, um, working with Dave Sharp at the time, who is the chair of House Education, uh, we were able to 
uh, their committee uh, uh, believed that the weight for poverty was, um, was not correct. Uh, myself and a number of others had been pushing, fighting to retain small schools grants, pushing for um, you know, the sparsity. And uh, so their, their committee decided um, that uh, poverty was underweighted and that we needed to do a study. And uh, that was great news. Um, and that began kind of a series of events of trying to get something passed. Uh, and so uh, we amended bills to try and force the issue. They eventually brought one out. Uh, and in 2017, we passed it. Um, uh, secretary Holcomb at the time, Rebecca Holcomb was the secretary, uh, pretty consistently told um, the legislature that if there was no money, there would be no study. Um, those of us who, um, who had been hoping, hoping, hoping for this uh, analysis to be conducted said, no, nope, we passed the study, the governor signed it and you gotta do it. We threatened to sue um, and the legislature uh, came back into session and appropriated some money um, for it. And so it came forward. Uh, the results, um, the study was finished. Uh, I actually heard from a reporter on Christmas Eve um, in 2019 asking if I had seen it, it had just come out. And uh, it, was, it was such a relief to see and know that we were not crazy. Um, and then it was really upsetting to think about and to be able to quantify the harm that had happened, not only to our kids, but to kids in all of these districts um, around the state and to be able to see the magnitude of the harm. Um, so a number of legislators that had been following this issue, um, we introduced legislation, H-54, um, which basically said, put these in place. It's not that hard. We have, uh, this is how we correct the existing system so that it delivers equity. It's not difficult. We already use weights to do this. We understand, uh, you know, the weights are <clears throat> the weights are how we um, ensure that we're dividing um, uh, any size uh, pot, uh, pot of resources equitably uh, according to need across the state. And so it's not difficult. That's how we do it now. The weights are not properly calibrated. Recalibrate them. We understand doing that creates um, shifts, can create shocks in the system. Um, much like X60 itself created shocks in the system. And um, we've been advocating for dealing with and addressing those shocks. You know, we can't just have um, districts that have been um, benefiting from this inequity uh, for 20 years, all of a sudden, you know, no matter how unfair that was, it wasn't their fault, you know, it was the system. So, you know, we have a responsibility to ensure that there's some stability in, in correcting the system. So, H54, um, it was a really tough, <clears throat> it was really tough sledding uh, to try and get that passed. Um, I will say that my colleagues and I in the in the House had an extremely robust conversation um, about uh, that bill, as well as what eventually came over from the Senate, which was um, this study for implementing uh, the weights. Uh, uh, this study, S13, to implement the weights um, is what brought us this task force um, in the spirit of compromise. Those uh, who were greatly alarmed um, by the potential shift, um, you know, had asked to look at categorical aid, which could also help um, mitigate that shift in resources, but by increasing um, taxes. Um, and uh, a, a, a number of different items where ta with the task force was asked to look at, but it is the task force for implementing the weights. So uh, this task force has been meeting. Um, we have a number, um, I have a number of colleagues on here. Um, the folks that have been, um, that were named to this task force, um, they're, uh, you know, the folks in the house are deeply, deeply um, aware of this issue. As I said, we had a very robust conversation um, I would say much more so than the Senate, which is, what I believe, one of the one of the challenges that we're facing. You know, the Senate um, has a lot less members and have to um, tackle twice as many issues, and so they just don't go as deep. And so um, that's that's challenging when you have an issue um, that presents as much challenges as this does. So task force is working, and um, 
you know, we we will. Uh, they're they're not proposing to implement the weights at this point. Uh, they are proposing um, cost equity, um, which is uh, something I think we'll be hearing about a little bit later. Um, I would not say that that is um, the same thing, or will have the same effect. Um, so. Happy to be here tonight. I really appreciate all of the folks uh, that have been working so hard on this. It really, really matters. I mean, investment in our kids is really, it's how we should be measured. So thanks, Kendra. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks for that great legislative update. It's appreciated. You talked a lot about the harm and I wanna kind of go back to that because a lot of you on the panel are coming from districts that are really struggling. And I want to see if you could speak um, to some of the issues that you're currently facing in, in your districts um, so that people have an understanding of what's really going on around the state. So anyone, if you can take that first. I'll be happy to jump in, Kendra. So uh, as noted earlier, uh, I'm the chair of the Cabot School uh, District, or the board in the district. and. Um, you know, like a lot of smaller rural towns, we didn't have an easy run of navigating the Act 46 process, and we haven't had an easy run of navigating increasingly difficult and uh, hostile education funding formula. Um, to much to our embarrassment, and uh, it makes bigger in WCX every time, Cabot has had a string in the past four years. We've only had a budget pass on the first vote once. Uh, our voters have become incredibly resistant. Uh, because of the excess spending threshold. It's viewed that it, we are somehow inefficient despite uh, cutting staff at a rate greater than our uh, decline in student enrollment and taking other steps to try to reduce uh, costs that were either out of control or inefficient. One of the main drivers of this is we have fairly intense student need. Now, I'm not going to say that we're the, a district that has an abnormally high level of poverty. Our food and reduced lunch is above the state average, but it's not as uh, bad as some of our neighbors in the, in the Northeast Kingdom. Unfortunately, um, but that said, we have approximately a quarter of our students that receive some form of a special service. And while there's state reimbursement and some of that money comes back, ultimately we have a student body that is on taken all together, considerably more expensive to educate than other districts. And when we start talking about special services, we're not talking about funds that are discretionary. So the idea underlying Brigham that there are districts that just spend a lot because they want to have great things, because they want to have you know brand new buses, because they want to have new uniforms for their sports teams. These are luxuries we never talk about or think about. Instead, what comes down to our, our discretionary spending is virtually non-existent because we're fully obligated to helping the kids we have meeting them where they are. As put this in context, one of the terms I never thought I'd hear or need to understand was the concept of un of unavailable for learning. And in 2018 and 2019, our school was really in a crisis. Um, you know, I look and see some of the things going on right now in uh, the Bristol School District and among others of uh, huge behavioral issues. Um, Catholic School went through that. And it, it, to meet that need, we had to make a substantial investment in behavioral interventionists and people who aren't even doing direct instruction, rather just trying to help students navigate the path. And I, I think for those of you in rural districts, you probably are familiar with this and know that our schools are more than just, you know, a, a warm place that's the fabric of the community. It is increasingly in rural areas, the only type of social service and support that many uh, young learners in need are getting. Um, I know that bears itself out to our more urban uh, districts, but schools are integral beyond just uh, education. The final point I'd make is, you know, putting this in context, we're rural, we have a fair amount of poverty, we have a fair amount of student need, and some of the things the legislature have, has done really are not necessarily helping. Uh, I know others will probably speak more artfully about Act 173, but our SU, uh, Caledonia Central, is uh, in position to lose over half a million dollars in funding um, at a really critical time and, and for a critical population. And uh, the, I think the biggest issue with that is it, Act 173 is still based upon a child count in districts, not the actual need or the number of students proportion in that district that are availing themselves or need special services. And um, so it's incredibly important to a small district like Cabot that we get waiting right, uh, not because we want to spend in our jest or give a tax break to our taxpayers. But we need to have the flexibility to meet the needs of all of our students, uh, including those um, in poverty and including those who who are not and are not engaged in special services. Um, so long as we can't 
um, equitably uh, access these funds or um, not face penalty, it's incredibly difficult for us to meet our fundamental educational mission. Rory, I'd love to jump in on what you said, because even though I'm from Winooski School District, it seems urban, a lot of our challenges are very similar in that way. Like, I, I think when I ran on the school board, I said that our school districts are the heart of our community, and it is important that we're building that legislation. And you can see what happens when you don't change the weighting formula over time. What happens is you truly get equality as opposed to equity, right? And you assume that all the funding is going to be assumed. And what I mean by that is that, like, I got to admit, the luxuries that you explained, I thought when I joined the school board, I thought it'd be like, got to save that art department or like, how are we going to save the athletic department, right? I don't, we don't have the luxury of arguing about what mascot needs to be changed here because when I was start on the school board, we were talking about busing versus whether we needed to update our building because we had classrooms where students were in closets. Our bucket brigade was like stopping the rain from falling on the thing, right? Like. Those aren't things that like any of us really expected to do when we were on the school board, right? Because those are the basic needs. But we also have different populations and this is the demographics of that waiting formula has changed that we know that like we get, we, we're changing in, in, in Vermont. We have in Winooski multi-language learners. And even though there might be federal funds that actually might help those students, we, because schools are the center of our communities. It's how we grow. It's how we grow. We also have to provide all that wraparound, that support. How do we handle the parents to keep them informed? How do we help um, like translation services to ensure that they are healthy? Because we also know that healthy students make great learners. And that's why Winooski has made those efforts. But every, every additional cost, this is where equality and equity is different, right? If we have the same amount, then that means we have to invest, we have to take away of investments from somewhere else. And we have in the Winooski school districts. We've taken away from potentially our teacher salaries. I've sat through school board budget meetings where I'm going like, we have to take away school supplies. And we're not a district that can like fundraise with a PTO or any of that and stuff. We could try to do the excess spending and all that and, and keep on spending more. But I remember, and, and I severely remember a gentleman saying, when we were going for the capital project bond, he goes like, yeah, Alex, you know, like what you all doing in Winooski is great. But he was a retired teacher and go like, how am I gonna stay in this district if we keep on increasing the tax rates? And that's the detriment of what happens when you have equality is the fact that like, we can't even keep our community together because we're forcing people out. And I think that's the detriment that I kind of want to make point about like the harm that we've done is that like for a lot of us that are in this room here is that we can't keep the basic needs of our students and we're kind of like not building a community, we're forcing people out. Thanks, Alex. So Alex, you you brought up a good point about um, kind of tax rates and, and property taxes and how we pay for this. And how does correcting the weights impact property taxes? I appreciate that you asked that question because I also have the joy because we're a smaller board of like presenting the financial budget to everybody in the town on town meeting day. And I think all of us, like we have reasonable people and, and you don't talk about from a weight, but you talk about a per people spending kind of formula in, in, in one way, right? And if I have to go up, if the weights are equalized, which is what they are right now, not adapted and understanding that different students take more money, it may seem that our school district, and I think Rory actually pointed this out, seems like we're spending a lot of money per student. But it doesn't account for the actual cost of, a, of all the different types of students that we have. And so my so instead of being able to present a financial budget that, you know, that says that we're only spending $10,000 per student, which I know that all of our like people in our town would go like, we're down at that low, the bottom half of the school district, we, that, that, that's irresponsible of us, right? They see us spending $17,000, $18,000 per student. And they're going like, wow. I, we, we can't increase the tax rate. Like, how are you like spending so much money? How are you being inefficient in how you're spending money? And part of that is mainly because we probably haven't done a, we, even though we understand it takes more money to spend a different type of student, the system that we're in 
is not giving us that flexibility to spend what we should be spending for our students. And those are simple comments that I get when I talk to like the public when I'm doing the financial thing. And, and, and once again, there are times where I really want to spend more, but I know that what will happen is that will drive people out and even drive the people that I hope to have built the school for, right? And I gotta admit, I don't know where they can live anymore in Vermont. And that's what waiting does. The, the impact of changing the taxing capacity of our weights. Thanks, Alex. Roy, you had um, talked earlier about Act 173, and I kind of want to go back to that just a little bit um, to see how the waiting study interacts with 173 for your districts. And this can be open to, to whoever wants to answer it. Um, but I just didn't want to not address um, how Act 173 interacts with the, with the waiting study. I can start and then uh, others can pick up if that, that works. Um, so for those of you who aren't super familiar with uh, which acts mean what, <laughs> Act 173 made really substantial changes to the way Vermont funds special education. So moving us from a reimbursement model where roughly 60% of your special education expenses were reimbursed from the state to a census block grant model based on uh, ADM or you know, student count, uh, um, not weighted pupils. So there's no accounting for student need in the resources that you'll receive from the state to fund um, special education costs. Um, and as part of the legislative deliberations on Act 173, I was with the School Boards Association at the time, and so it was very um, present on, in many of those deliberations. It was widely recognized in the committees that implementation of a block grant to fund special education would negatively fund, uh, negatively impact high poverty small districts. And that in the absence of doing something on the weights, it would essentially represent a transfer of resources uh, away from small high need districts to larger districts who may or may not have uh, the same level of need. Um, and that was one reason why the waiting study was included as part of Act 173 in recognition of that fact. Um, and the theory was that if the funding system as a whole better accounted for student need, then uh, through weights, then the transition to the block grant um, would not result in a violation of Brigham. Um, and so that law passed in 2018. Implementation has been delayed uh, multiple times now. Um, but FY23, so the year that we're all preparing budgets for as we speak, will be the first year uh, where we'll start to see the effects of uh, implementation. And for Winooski, we're going to see in one first year a loss of $345,000. Um, over what we budgeted for in, uh, in reimbursements in FY22. Uh, and once fully implemented, we're going to see closer to uh, over $800,000 less in revenue. Uh, and that's based on you know, a moment in time, which assumes that costs uh, are frozen, when in fact we know salaries and benefits and expenses to, uh, to support our students uh, increase um, substantially year over year. So this loss of revenue on the special ed side pushes up our education spending for equalized pupil, um, which then translates into higher tax rates for our um, already uh, overtaxed, underweighted district. Um, and so, so my view is that we cannot move forward with implementation of 173 in the absence of fixing the weights, um, because doing so uh, would violate those principles of Brigham that I talked about earlier. And I, I've spoken to several colleagues around the state who are projecting similar uh, impacts um, uh, as a result of implementation of the law. Ted, you're shaking your head. Do you wanna add anything? Well, I, I think Nicole described it very clearly and Rutland City, unfortunately, is looking at the same type of negative hit fiscally that she described so well. Um, it's it was not intended, and it's very unfortunate that the state is going ahead with implementation of the block grant reimbursement without the benefit of the weighting study factor adjustments 
And it's going to probably involve hundreds of thousands of dollars of loss for us that the student needs haven't changed, um, but the, the revenues that we're going to receive in order to provide those state mandated services will change. And the answer inevitably becomes, well, the district is committed to providing services that every student needs. We obviously will comply with state regulations and requirements um, as always, but we're going to have less revenue from the state unless something is done regarding the waiting study. Um, and, that, and, and that is going to require us to find revenue somewhere else, which means coming out of the general education programs unless we're fortunate enough to find some other federal grants to fill the hole. And I know that that is probably not what most, if all legislators do not want, but that is the situation that we have been put in. Thank you. So I'd like to pivot a little bit and I'd like to talk about um, some of what the task force um, is proposing. And before we do that, I would like to just be sure people who are on this call listening understand the difference between what categorical aid is versus correcting the weight, because I think it can be confusing. Um, and I just, before we move on to what the task force is proposing, if someone could just address what the differences of those two are, I would appreciate it. Yeah, so I'm happy to take, uh, take a swing at that uh, categorical aid um, we have categorical aid uh, now, some programs. Uh, one program um, is uh, small schools grant. Uh, and that is something that has been threatened um, year after year after year. Um, it's been used as you know, a political bargaining um, chip and needed to be renegotiated, you know, went well, was renegotiated whenever uh, there were short funds. There are other categorical aid programs, uh, transportation, special education, uh, <clears throat> uh, that, that are used, um, that are targeted funds um, for specific uses. Uh, the weights are how we, they're really a part of our, uh, how we equalize and ensure that we are providing equity of opportunity with the resources that we have around the state. As I said, uh, the weights, when they are calibrated, basically serve to divide a pot of resources um, for the number of students that we have. And we want them to divide those resources in a way that we are the state, which has the responsibility to ensure substantial equity um, of opportunity for all kids, um, that the state is ensuring that enough resources are going to students with different learning needs or in different learning environments to um, to uh, provide for substantially equal outcomes. You know, how do we teach algebra one to a student in poverty, an ELL learner, a student in a wealthy large town? Um, and, uh, you know, how much does it cost? It's, it costs different, uh, it costs a different amount in those types of towns. So that's how the weights work. Um, categorical aid, uh, the committees, have been, uh, this was part of the discussion in the House, have really been focused on categorical aid because it is targeted, um, being a means of ensuring some accountability for resources. Uh, and this is a particularly objectionable <clears throat> um, uh, argument that uh, we heard in the House uh, and we've heard um, in the task force. And something that we've tried to explain really is tantamount to poverty shaming. Um, when you, are, uh, when you are saying right now, we have uh, our funding is out of whack. So we have districts that the state has ensured are over accessing resources, more resources than their students need to you know, have equitable opportunities with other students. That means that we have students that um, we know have access to less resources. There's no question about what's been happening with these students uh, in these districts that have had access to more resources. We just presume that those school boards have been doing the best that they can, making the best decisions that they can, that communities have been voting uh, for, um, for curriculum and programs that benefit their kids as much as they can within you know, uh, reasonable tax constraints. 
And so shifting this, <clears throat> shifting the weights, correcting the weights, shifting the balance of the weights um, and ensuring that our most needy students have uh, access to resources. Now there is concern that um, we ha I have heard, uh, I had heard uh, in various committees in the house, um, you know, how do we know that those districts won't use, uh, if we give them more access to resources that they won't use them to lower their tax rate. Um, coming from an area that has seen districts um, end up in the excess spending threshold year after year after year, trying to provide a basic program, I would say it might be um, a reasonable thing to do to provide some um, <laughs> tax relief there. Um, but also, you're not asking that question of every district around the state. You're trying to now control how the funds are used just for the districts that have students with extra learning needs. And that is not right. Uh, and that's really what categorical aid, um, that's really one of the negative things about categorical aid. Can I jump in too, yeah. Andra, on Please this? Please in, do. in the sense that like, when you're looking at it, and I think when we're looking at categorical aid and weighting, the key question really for all of us is what was your methodology and how you got to those weights? And I think one of the things that we're making like uh, assumptions that we keep on saying it's equitable and all that, but what do we mean by equitable? And that's what was the beauty of T Professor Colby and Professor Baker's study was that they linked these characteristics to student outcomes. They built a formula so that we could actually look, and if you, let's use the baseball analogy that we always love about like equality and equity, right? Like they use those to actually determine the true size of the boxes that were needed for each different type of learner so that they could oversee and look at the baseball game because it was tied to equity. The issue that I really have with some of our like categorical aid problems here is that they're not linking and developing formulas based off of a student outcome how they're determining a lot of our formulas are based off our past behavior, which we've already, already if you've heard from us, we're like, you've already constrained us in how we're going to educate our students. So you constrained us by using past budgets to construct a formula that says like, oh, so we're going to give you a little bit more. But that's not equitable. That's more equality because you already had an unfair system that didn't allow us. Now you're using past behavior. The weights, and once again, I'm going to emphasize the weights with all that statistical analysis in simplified terms. It was a more precision way to figure out how to like get us the right box size of the boxes so that we could give all of our students equitable outcome. And that's what I think is what people need to understand when they're talking to legislators. So like, let's look at the methodology and how you're creating your formulas. I mean, the proposal that was put forward for ELL, mm -hmm. um, it, it will require, it will need to be recalculated every year. And, and it's not based on any empirical evidence. It's based on what we're currently spending, as Alex was saying, which we have no, I mean, that does not relate in any way to how we determine equity in our system, not in any way. Yep. And I think there's good intention I think there are good intentions in trying to do this, you know, I don't, but it's not, it's not, it doesn't work. Yep. Ed, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I would just like to build upon a little bit, and I'll, I promise I'll do it as briefly as possible, the comments that Alex and Laura are sharing here, because I think they're really hitting a very pivotal and a very important issue. Um, when one thinks in terms of the, the, so-called cost equity proposal versus the recommendations of the UVM Rutgers study. You know, when I think about what I've heard in terms of the cost equity proposal, my reaction is a very simple one. Uh, that from what I hear, that proposal is going to create more administrative work. As Laura said, it's going to need to be updated every year, according to Professor Colby. It's going to create more administrative work without any demonstrated or clear incremental benefit, at least none that I have read or heard about, as compared with simply the more straightforward and statistically or empirically founded implementation of the updated weights, as Alex described so well. In fact, 
you know, I, I want to emphasize now a real key point that we've danced around here, but I think is really important. On October 22nd, Professor Colby and Professor Baker sent a several page memo, very well written like the study, to the task force in answer to some of the questions that, uh, that they had posed. And in that memo, Professor Colby is very clear. She states that one of the dollar costs that was derived from metrics in the study, $2,900 for ELL students as an increment, should not be used. I mean, that is not a sound policy decision because the, the proposal as it's being promulgated and described, okay, it does use metrics from this waiting study, but it reversed engineers from the cost models in a way that Professor Colby does not agree with at all. And she stated it very clearly on October 22nd. And so I think it bears careful consideration uh, when one of the study authors is saying, uh, we don't really agree with what you're doing with our study and how you're doing it. And the last thing I wanna say is, um, well, actually I have two last comments and thank you for your patience. The, you know, Laura had talked about and, and Alex had talked about the discretion and the determinations that need to be made at local levels when it comes to deciding how resources will best be allocated for the benefit of students. Frankly, you know, and I am a newcomer to Vermont, I'll acknowledge that, but I do not understand why um, our most experienced legislators and well-intended legislators believe that they have the knowledge and the skill to make decisions in Montpelier that are going to be superior in some way to the decisions that are made by local school boards, local school administrators, parents, others in the community who are more familiar with the students. Um, I, I, just, I just don't see how that's possible from a process standpoint. Perhaps, perhaps those folks have the information and the knowledge and the skill, but I haven't seen that demonstrated. And the last point that I did wanna make is because Alex, I think was touching on really key, key points when he distinguished between e equality and equity. Because personally, and this is just my opinion, which is why I've saved this comment for last, I think to call something a cost equity proposal is a serious misnomer. In fact, I'm not even sure you can call it a cost equality proposal. But just to go with that for a moment, let's remind ourselves equality is defined as when each person or group of people is provided with the same resources or opportunities, $2,900 per ELL student, whereas equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and, and we have to allocate resources and opportunities in order to reach an equal outcome. And as Alex said, that's what the waiting study focused on in its modeling and its research. I haven't seen any similar uh, demonstration for the cost equity proposal, which I think would be a huge setback for the state. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Ted. I think it's really important to talk about this cost equity proposal because it is right now what the implementation task force is considering. And so I'd love to hear if other panelists um, want to talk about that and if they have other concerns with this proposal, because this is what is currently on the table um, from the implementation task force. I will throw one on, which is you know, this is not the same old system. This is a new system. You know, we have no idea. Uh, we haven't seen the projections for how this works, the data behind it. And, you know, this is the place of unintended consequences. And, uh, you know, what is the compelling reason for um, doing that? Uh, yeah, I, I can't figure out how it will work. Um, what I've heard in the task force meetings is that it's an attempt to sort of move the impact of waiting for student need earlier in the calculation so that it doesn't happen at the point where um, you're calculating tax rates. It happens um, to calculate the amount of offsetting revenue a district will get 
which then uh, the tax rate calculation happens after that. Um, but how those cost equity grants will be funded uh, if they're divorced from um, tax rate calculations is a mystery. Uh, does this mean all sales and use tax and non-residential taxes get used to pay for the cost equity grants and homestead taxes pick up the balance, uh, which would again put more pressure on the homestead rates? I, I, I would love to see an Ed Fund balance sheet uh, that shows how uh, this proposal would affect the bottom line on the Ed Fund and where the revenue is going to come from in order to um, generate the, the funds for these cost equity grants. At, at, to Ted's point, just because you <laughs> call something equity uh, doesn't make it so. Um, you need to actually see how that love, that magnitude of change to the formula, how that plays out um, through both the Ed Fund and um, to individual districts in order to really make heads or tails of uh, whether it's a good approach to take. And uh, at this late stage in the game, it, it, I don't know that the analysis has been done in order to really evaluate whether that's a good thing to do. Corey? Yeah, I hate to drop a bit of cynicism here, but when I first read and tried to make sense of it, it just seemed like um, a disregard for something evidence-based instead substituting political judgment and uh, you know, and we be able to attempt to keep something closer to the status quo. And I think Nicole hit the nail on the head, which is by putting it earlier in the process, there would hopefully be less direct impact on tax rate or in some respects, maybe plausible deniability for the legislature to be responsible for uh, the shifts and where, um, where that burden is uh, among Vermonters. And, um, you know, I think to Ted's point, everyone, and Alex as well, everyone lo loves local control until it looks like it's gonna cost them money and they don't get a direct benefit from it. And, you know, I think um, putting a lot of thought into this and looking back at Brigham, we have, we have the roadmap here. Act 60 itself is the system to use, the weights address uh, the imbalance in that system. And I think if we get out there, the unintended consequences and the risk to our students are are real just as much as Act 173 is having some unintended consequences by not being linked into the realities on the ground, so too uh, can this. And for any of the board members on here, what is the number one enemy we have is uncertainty. Um, we're already coming up on the FY23 budget season. It's very uncertain what the year looks like. And um, small school grant, for example, like every year we sit and wait, what's the dollar amount going to be? Are we going to get it? What does it look like? And uh, that makes it really difficult to make the sort of long reaching planning and decisions that kids need to succeed, so. Excellent. And I have heard um, that this cost equity proposal also might open some kind of voucher question. Um, can anyone speak to that? Ted? Oh, I'd be glad to start that conversation. I mean, clearly to the extent that the, um, the cost equity proposal would, I mean, it would almost go back to a foundational formula of sorts by saying it's going to be this number of dollars per student. Um, fundamentally, I have, I have a, an issue with that because not all students are the same and one dollar figure per ELL student shouldn't apply because there are different skill levels. But then the next question that this raises is, well, if somebody decides to go ahead and set up a brand new system that assigns dollars per student, whether it's a base or layering them on, isn't the next step potentially to introduce a voucher and say, well, now we've decided that this student right here is going to cost $17,000 a year to educate and um, we can either spend that in the public system or we can give you a voucher to go spend it in private schools if you prefer. And there are a lot of people who believe that's a, a, that would be a good approach, just as there are a lot of people who believe that would not be a good approach. But clearly this is a step in that direction and 
when Rory mentioned a moment ago that, you know, he has to wonder about why, you know, they would be going in such a direction, why you would ignore empirically based results, uh, why you would implement something that involves far more subjective judgments than, than, than what we have had even, um, you have to wonder, well, then what's the motivation if there are no other costs and benefits? Is this a, is this a next step toward voucher and private schools? I don't know, but it does concern me. Thanks, Kendra, I, I would just jump in really quick and, and note that the task force did actually also do a, a lot of work on the existing weights. Um, they did look at poverty. They did look at, you know, additive versus multiplicative. They did work with Professor Colby to kind of refine, um, refine the findings and see, and uh, that is still an option that is out there, um, but that does not appear to be on the table. So I thought... One of my one of my uh, house colleagues who is paying attention actually noted we should probably uh, mention that as well. Uh, yeah. And that that to me is a, a good option for us to be asking them to to be looking at implementing. And is is there someone that can explain cost equity in terms of dollar amounts being associated with types of learners versus weights? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I. Let me see if I can explain it simply. So, um, you know, what they've tried to do, what the, the concern was that um, people who are higher, districts that are higher spenders would be able to leverage the weight for additional resources, um, which is how the, I mean, so <clears throat> they tried to extrapolate um, uh, a dollar amount out of the weights, uh, out of the study that uh, was done. Um, and use that to multiply by the weights to come up with a block grant amount, basically, for students. Um, and the difference is, um, the difference is um, between this year, you know, every year you're going to get one, you know, your students are going to get one one thousandth of the pie. Um, or this year, you know, your student is going to get $10,000. And next year, your student's going to get $10,000. And the year after, they're going to get $10,000. At some point, $10,000 is not going to be enough. You know, but with the one 1,000, you know, when you're looking at how are we, which is what the weights do, um, you know, you're maintaining that balance amongst all of Vermont's students, which is what this system is supposed to do. <laughs> this is really just trying to control the cost for the students with the higher needs. It's not necessarily trying to control costs for, it doesn't appear. Again, we don't have all the data for um, students that don't have the need. I don't know if I got it there, guys, but. Well, it also assumes the purchasing power of a dollar is equal in all parts of the state, which is not true. That, that's really helpful. Thank you, Laura. Um, and I also want to now, I want to jump into um, what the task force is talking about with ELL, because I also think it's a really important thing to talk about. Um, so I'm hoping someone can talk about what they're proposing. Um, because maybe, I don't know, Nicole, if you want to take that one. Yeah, sure. So as of their most recent meeting, uh, the task force um, has apparently accepted all of the revised weights um, that uh, Ted mentioned, Professor Colby's October memo, um, based on some of the directions that the task force had decided to take. They requested that she um, uh, remodel uh, the weights uh, with those assumptions, uh, one of which was to change the existing calculation for poverty um, and to use uh, free and reduced lunch status um, as opposed to the current measure. The current measure um, actually counts students who are, are, are in families that are eligible for economic services uh, through the through the state and, and ELL students are counted as part of uh, the poverty count in addition to being counted um, uh, as English language learners. So they've accepted the revised weights from Professor Colby, which by divorce, you know, changing to a new poverty measure had the effect of increasing substantially the weight for English language learners. Um, and so they've accepted all of the revised weights with the sole exception of the weights for English language learners. 
And their proposal is to um, provide categorical grants, uh, which would be $25,000 per district that has at least one English language learner, and then $5,000 for every additional English language learner. And the methodology for that $5,000 was um, looks similar to what is currently being spent in districts. And they also looked at other state aid programs for English language learners. Um, so um, $5,000 uh, per student does not come anywhere near close to the recommended weight of 2.49. Um, and English language learners are the only group of students who are treated this way, who are separated outside of the formula. Um, and I'm going to go back to Brigham, um, which stated that education was a fundamental right in this state. We're, we're, not every state has that uh, listed in their constitution as a fundamental right, but Vermont does. And they said, quote, in Vermont, the right to education is so integral to our constitutional form of government that any statutory framework that infringes upon the equal enjoyment of that right bears a heavy burden of justification. So they've chosen, at least it appears for now, to segregate English language learner funding from the rest of the formula. And they've set that amount at substantially less than empirical analysis says it should be. Um, and I believe that this is a pretty cut and dry case of discrimination on the basis of national origin and language and is a violation of Vermont's constitution. So once the legislature makes the decision to update the weights, accepts the premise that the weights are out of date and need to be updated in order to better meet the educational needs of students, they cannot decide to treat English language learners differently and in a manner that makes it more difficult for them to access and spend state education dollars. And so in addition to the, the flaws with categorical aid that Alex, um, Laura and Ted uh, touched upon earlier, um, I believe it's also a violation of the constitution to, to continue to go down this road. Um, and we've shared those concerns uh, with members of the task force. Um, but it appears as though uh, they may be starting to reconsider whether 5,000 is the right amount. Uh, but at the last meeting, it sounded as though, uh, again, a real heavy emphasis on, you know, are these districts really following best practice? How do we connect these funds to best practice? Um, in a way that those, they are not asking those questions about other students or, or districts. So thank you for the opportunity to share that. Thanks, Nicole. So in, in following this, because I think this is a really important discussion, um, how does this proposal impact wealthier low incidence districts? Well, you can see in some of the models that have been shown, um, the most recent modeling, um, actually was useful in terms of it compared, you know, what the tax rates would be in districts under uh, the 2.49 weight versus categorical aid. And there's also cost equity, which I just sort of ignore because I don't fully understand. But when you look at the differences between tax rates in districts that do not have large numbers of ELL students, um, there's not a substantial um, uh, benefit uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't change whether or not you do categorical aid or by weights. The major difference is between for districts that have some number of ELL students, um, which, you know, obviously my eyes are drawn toward Winooski, the difference between the categorical aid program and using weights is roughly 40 cents. Um, and, but our, um, uh, our overweighted neighbors <laughs> would see an infusion of resources and uh, no real negative effects on their tax rates, depending on which proposal you look at. So it does harm to districts that serve large numbers of ELL students. Thanks, Nicole. So 
It's about 8.10. We did want to leave some time for questions. Um, but as we wrap up this discussion, I would like to ask um, what each of you hope for this issue moving into this next legislative session. Anyone can start. I'll start first because I think when I first started and joined this coalition, one of the things that like really appealed to me about this bond, this this changing in the way and, and doing something innovative was that it didn't pit the rural with the urban. It was a unifying thing about like uniting Vermont. And I think that if we go back to the weights and because it's gonna be based on, as I've said earlier, if you're gonna come up with the methodology, make sure that the methodology is tied to equitable outcomes, equitable. That's the key, not equal sources of funding or whatever, it's the equitable outcomes perspective. And I really want the task force to go back to look at the weights and really form that because this is a signature bill that could really unite and change how Vermont is and keeps its character. Um, and I've said this before, like if you want to keep the constitution of Vermont, if you want a true democracy of the, of a, for the people, of the people, by the people, then we need equitable outcomes and we really need to educate all of our students in a way that allows them to be the best Vermonter they can be. I am hoping to see uh, the legislative leadership, uh, the Speaker of the House, the Senate pro tem, um, the governor, um, really insist on addressing this issue this year. Um, you know, you asked about what happens when we shift the weights in a larger wealthy district when, we, when we're not considering um, just ELL, um, there, 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 will be, there will be an effect there that will, um, that will create um, some, some uh, instability in their rates. And we are uh, in a unique moment in time where there's funding in this state that could be used to help mitigate that and really provide um, a pretty slow, um, slow walk. And the longer we wait, uh, the harder that becomes. Um, and the longer we wait, um, the more our communities and our kids suffer. So, uh, you know, I think this issue finally um, is actually fairly understood by those in power and what needs to be done to fix it. And so I'm hoping to see um, courage and um, and the you know the competence that I know exists used to um, bring the solution forward finally and get some um, justice really for um, for kids and communities that have been left behind for two decades. I'm looking for three things. The first is to implement the sound recommendations that were clearly provided by the UVM Rutger studies. The second is for the task force to implement or develop an implementation schedule and a set of actions that would ease the transition period as needed for districts that will need time perhaps to make adjustments um, you don't want to put anybody in a position of having to make adjustments overnight. That's counterproductive for all. And the third is that if the task force deems that our entire educational funding system needs to be overhauled in a dramatic way, as would a, a cost equity proposal, then I would encourage those members to commission a second and a different study hopefully one that can be given the resources and the thought that is merited by such a consequential decision. If there's a better way, great. Uh, let's have a, a clear and a comprehensive study rather than a hurry up offense to try and finish by December 15th, a report that completely upends and changes the educational funding system in this state. Thank you. Yeah, I would just to echo and build on what others have, have said, I do think that this um, making these changes involves a redistribution of, of resources, um, and that's politically challenging, and I'm very appreciative of that. Um, and so I do think it will take courage and leadership to get it done. 
And I'm grateful to the coalition for providing that um, leadership uh, and, and many others around the state, in particular Representative Sebelia for being so dogged in your pursuits. Um, but what I'm really looking for is for them to build the runway, not a new plane. So, so we have uh, very clear information about how we can adjust the weights in order to better meet the needs of students. It will be hard for districts to adapt overnight. We do need a plan to get us to full implementation over the course of several years. I do not think we need a new funding system. It's the, uh, the great benefit of going last is to have a lot of uh, incredible comments to build off of. And the theme that came out and the word I heard was over and over again was courage. And to make a big change in something as critical to Vermont as education finance and how we allocate those funds it requires courage. And it doesn't take much looking at different, and, you know, in my, putting on my state's attorney hat, I get to be, you know, play a politician to some extent. And you have to make tough decisions when you're in a position of trust. And so the legislature, the governor, the agency of education, all these officials, uh, whether elected or appointed, have to make tough decisions. And the tough decision here, to me, is fundamentally whether people are going to pay lip service to the concept of equity, to lip service an opportunity for children, whether they're in Cabot or Peachum or Winooski or Burlington or Rutland, or um, whether that's a talking point and when you know, when it's time to take action, the status quo wins. Um, so I guess I'm hoping that the legislature takes seriously a well-documented, well-supported empirical study and sets aside other exploration. Uh, I couldn't agree more with Nicole. Implement the plan. The, the legislation enabling the task force was to implement, not to come up with alternate, but to implement. So I, I would hope that they have the courage to meet the mandate I really hope that when the legislature reconvenes, uh, that there is the uh, fortitude and leadership to deliver on the promises of equity and really to put the kids first. And it shouldn't matter whether that kid is in a rural part of the state, an urban part of the state, in a wealthy district, underweight, overweight. At the end of the day, these are all Vermonters. We face challenges together as stakeholders in the state. Uh, and time and time again, we hear that we need to stop rural decline, we need to revitalize our you know, more urban communities. Well, that starts with keeping Vermonters here. And we can only do that by having an equitable education system that gives opportunities across the board. Because our next scientist or our next governor might come from Swanton, might come from Brighton, might come from Newport. We don't know, uh, but they need, every kid needs a chance. Thank you to all of you who came tonight and gave us such a really informative and valuable um, insight into the into all these topics into education uh, finance and funding in Vermont we really appreciate it and now we'd like to open the floor to questions so if you have a question please use the raise hand icon and Mark will call on you and unmute you and Mark we probably I'm not sure if we have anything in the chat as well but I'll hand that over to you now Thank you, Kendra. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Mark Schauber. I'm the executive director for Coalition for Vermont Student Equity, as well as a board member from River Valley's school district. Um, we have a couple of questions in chat. Um, first one, um, as I understand it, excess spending threshold will be forgiven for the coming year at, at least. Is this still going to be true? Uh, Laura, you want to take that? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it was paused for two years. I think there's some discussion about um, whether or not to bring it back at all. Um, uh, I believe it does need to come back when the weights are corrected. Um, and it provides a ceiling. Um, you know, there's been some talk about providing a floor, which, you know, sure. Um, but yes, it is paused for this year. And uh, it really needed to be paused because you're penalizing districts that are reaching to educate for their students and bumping and and you may not have provided them likely did not provide them enough access to resources for their students equitable access so thank you Laura um, we have one other question uh, this was partially answered but um, explain how the task force plan will open the door to vouchers and polarization of communities 
Um, I'll open that up to all of you. It's a light topic. Someone wants to take it. Well, I probably can't speak to the mechanics of the most recent proposal and how that plays out. But I can say this, and as a smaller, you know, and rural district, as you will, uh, we're surrounded by some larger districts, and uh, we've had challenges in the past where people said, "Well, you know, you're just small, close your high school." We've looked at the different cost models; it doesn't really save money, but what it does do is it shifts burden for transportation and um, onto families. And fundamentally, one of the things I'm concerned about with a voucher-based program or districts that get pushed to be choice one way or the other is it stratifies opportunity. It doesn't um, create equity in my eyes at all. Um, in a place like Cabot, one can presume our, you know, wealthier, well-to-do families don't have transportation impediments to transport their kids to St. John's Bay Academy or to Montpelier or these really, you know, premier and well-regarded schools. Not to say to the detriment of the schools, you know, closer to us, but those options aren't realistic for kids whose parents can't put gas in the in the tank to be able, you know, to get work or with kids to live with a grandparent because their, you know, parents are um, unable to provide care for them. So there are things when I hear a voucher program or that that's an opportunity, I feel like that would drive further inequity in the system and destabilize public education as we know in Vermont. And to me, one of the things that when I decided to, you know, move back to Vermont after military service, uh, quality of life and quality of education were two of the driving factors for it. Uh, so I think if we have difficulty uh, maintaining the vibrancy of rural communities or keeping young Vermonters here, we'll only exacerbate that if we uh, further degrade or break down uh, the integrity of our public education system. And uh, when I hear the word voucher, it, it terrifies me. Thank you, Rory. Um, oh, that just scrolled up. Um, I'm going to save that question for the last. Um, is a potential for a last minute legal action in June, depending on what emerges from the legislative session? Won't that be chaotic? Worry? Well, you know, I think that it's premature to even really think about that. The legislature has a full session ahead of it. Um, I think it's gonna be a very interesting legislative year. I'm sure uh, Laura can attest to that. Yeah, there's a lot that the legislature has to dig up. Um, that said, um, the task force uh, on implementation is, is going to do what it's going to do. And if the recommendations made um, are consistent with what you know, this group views as being in the best interest of Vermonters and its students, then there's the, the full legislature. And at the end of the day, um, there are awful lot of underweight districts out there. And there are some that don't really have a big change depending on how the shifts. And uh, as I said before, we kept coming back to courage as a word. Um, I really do believe that our representatives and senators are people of character and will work hard to come up with a solution that works. Uh, so the audience here and, and people who have a stake in education um, really ought to appeal to the broader group before looking at more uh, drastic options. Thank you for that, Rory. Um, so uh, has the task force to date dodged its responsibility to implement the study by proposing an alternative that maintains the status quo rather than addressing the historic inequality. Nicole? Uh, I wouldn't say it's dodged its responsibility. I would say it's sort of gotten off course. Um, and, it, you know, it's not unusual for a legislative task force to, through the workings of its own members who have their own perspectives and uh, interests in addressing issues related to the education system or ed funding to sort of go down certain paths. They've, they've also heard from a variety of stakeholders uh, who, who, you know, support um, a, a cost equity approach or a categorical or some, some departure from the UVM study. So I, I think that they have, are, you know, genuinely uh, engaged in difficult work um, and, and I think, um, you know, given the time that any task force has, um, it's unfortunate that the focus wasn't more on how do we implement the recommendations of this study and, and got broadened into what might we do to address a host of issues with the education funding system. How's that for dodging the question? <laughs> that, that was 
Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Um, as last question, um, unless somebody else wants to throw another one at us, um, I'm actually going to direct towards you, Kendra, because it's a perfect segue um, to um, closing out the, the meeting. Um, what can we do to voice strongly this month on, this, on the state task force website? It says they meet December 1 and December 10. How can we make an impact in this month? That's a great question. Um, there's actually a task force meeting that's coming that is this Wednesday from nine to three, where they will be presenting their proposal. So you can tune into that if you can't be there during the day they always have we, we have a link on our coalition website as well, um, that you could watch the meeting. But there is an opportunity for public comment at that meeting. So after the meeting, there's always opportunities for public comment. And so if you so choose, um, you can sign up and you can ask them some questions about their, their current proposals and maybe ask them to stick to implementing the weights. Um, we on the coalition, you can always check our website, which is www.cvtse.org. Um, we have, we try to keep it as up to date as we possibly can with any current legislative updates. We have links to the task force meetings. We have links to articles. Um, and there you can also ask any questions that you might have because we do um, monitor that and can answer any questions that you all have in addition to the ones. So there's a lovely slide. Um, thank you for coming tonight. We appreciate your time and we hope you have a great, great rest of your evening. Alex, did you want to say something before we finish? Oh, I didn't know. I saw Sonia had her hand up and I don't know if she wanted to ask her question. No, thank you. It was that was the question was what can we do? I, it's it's frustrating that um, I, I mean, I'm glad to be a part of the coalition, but it's just there. It feels like we need to have like some um, grassroots effort here to really um, lobby our um, our own legislators, but the task force to really um, listen to our voices and um, work together to try to to change the direction, I suppose. Yeah, and I think it it takes a village and it takes all our voices. And I think we none of us should be afraid of using our voices. So let's let's do this together. And um, if you have ideas for how we can better advocate, we would love to hear them. So thank you. And with that, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, appreciate everybody coming. And again, um, please be in touch with us if you have any questions. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks.